The Witness for the Prosecution by Agatha Christie Mr. Mayhern adjusted his pince-nez and cleared his throat with a little dry-as-dust cough that was wholly typical of him. Then he looked again at the man opposite him, the man charged with willful murder. Mr. Mayhern was a small man, precise in manner, neatly, not to say foppishly dressed, with a pair of very shrewd and piercing grey eyes. By no means a fool. Indeed, as a solicitor, Mr. Mayhern's reputation stood very high. His voice, when he spoke to his client, was dry, but not unsympathetic. I must impress upon you again that you are in very grave danger, and that the utmost frankness is necessary. Leonard Vole, who had been staring in a dazed fashion at the blank wall in front of him, transferred his glance to the solicitor. "'I know,' he said hopelessly, "'you, you keep telling me so. But I can't seem to realise yet that I'm charged with murder. Murder! And such a dastardly crime, too!' Mr. Mahern was practical, not emotional. He coughed again took off his pince-nez, polished them carefully, and replaced them on his nose. Then, he said, Yes, 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 now, my dear Mr. Vole, we are going to make a determined effort to get you off, and we shall succeed, we shall succeed. But I must have all the facts. I must know just how damaging the case against you is likely to be. Then we can fix upon the best line of defence. Still the young man looked at him in the same dazed, hopeless fashion. To Mr. Mayhern the case had seemed black enough, and the guilt of the prisoner assured. Now, for the first time, he felt a doubt. "'You think I'm guilty,' said Leonard Vole in a low voice. "'But by God, I swear I'm not. It, it looks pretty black against me, I know that.' I'm like a man caught in a net, the meshes of it all around me, entangling me whichever way I turn. But I didn't do it. Mr. Mayhern, I didn't do it. In such a position, a man was bound to protest his innocence. Mr. Mayhern knew that. Yet, in spite of himself, he was impressed. It might be, after all, that Leonard Vole was innocent. "'You are right, Mr. Vole,' he said gravely. "'The case does look very black against you. "'Nevertheless, I accept your assurance. "'Now, uh, let us get to facts. "'I want you to tell me in your own words "'exactly how you came to make the acquaintance of Miss Emily French. "'It was one day in Oxford Street. "'I saw an elderly lady crossing the road. "'She was carrying a lot of parcels. "'In the middle of the street she dropped them. Uh, tried to recover them, found a bus was almost on top of her, and just managed to reach the curb safely, dazed and bewildered by people having shouted at her. I recovered her parcels, wiped the mud off them as best I could, retied the string of one, and returned them to her. There was no question of you having saved her life. Oh, dear me, no. All I did was to perform a common act of courtesy— She was extremely grateful, thanked me warmly, and said something about my manners not being those of most of the younger generation. I can't remember the exact words. Then I lifted my hat and went on. I never expected to see her again. But life is full of coincidences. That very evening I came across her at a party at a friend's house. She recognised me at once and asked that I should be introduced to her. I then found out that she was a Miss Emily French and that she lived in Cricklewood. I talked to her for some time. Uh, She was, I imagined, an old lady who took sudden and violent fancies to people. She took one to me on the strength of a perfectly simple action which anyone might have performed. On leaving, she shook me warmly by the hand and asked me to come and see her. I replied, of course, that I should be very pleased to do so, and she then urged me to name a day. 
I did not want particularly to go, but it would have seemed churlish to refuse, so I fixed on the following Saturday. After she had gone, I learned something about her from my friends, uh, that she was rich, eccentric, lived alone with one maid, and owned no less than eight cats. I see, said Mr. Mayhern. The question of her being well off came up as early as that. If you mean that I inquired, began Leonard Vole hotly, but Mr. Mayhern stilled him with a gesture. I have to look at the case as it will be presented by the other side. An ordinary observer would not have supposed Miss French to be a lady of means. She lived poorly, almost humbly. Unless you had been told the contrary, you would in all probability have considered her to be in poor circumstances, at any rate to begin with. Who was it, exactly, who told you that she was well off? My friend George Harvey, at whose house the party took place. Is he likely to remember having done so? I, I really don't know. Of course, it is some time ago now. Quite so, Mr. Vole. You see, the first aim of the prosecution will be to establish that you were in low water financially. That is true, is it not? Leonard Vole flushed. Yes, he said in a low voice. I'd been having a run of infernal bad luck just then. Quite so said Mr. Mayhern again, that being, as I say, in low water financially, you met this rich old lady and cultivated her acquaintance assiduously. Now, if we are in a position to say that you had no idea she was well off, and that you visited her out of pure kindness of heart, which is the case, I dare say, I'm not disputing the point, I'm looking at it from the outside point of view. A great deal depends on the memory of Mr. Harvey. Is he likely to remember that conversation, or is he not? Could he be confused by counsel into believing that it took place later? Leonard Vaux reflected for some minutes. Then he said steadily enough, but with a rather paler face, I do not think that that line would be successful, Mr. Mayhern. Several of those present heard his remark, and one or two of them chaffed me about my conquest of a rich old lady. The solicitor endeavoured to hide his disappointment with a wave of the hand. Unfortunate, he said, but I congratulate you upon your plain speaking, Mr. Vole. It is to you I look to guide me. Your judgment is quite right. To persist in the line I spoke of would have been disastrous. We must leave that point. You made the acquaintance of Miss French, you called upon her, the acquaintanceship progressed. We want a clear reason for all this. Why did you, a young man of thirty-three, good-looking, fond of sport, popular with your friends, devote so much of your time to an elderly woman with whom you could hardly have anything in common? Leonard Vole flung out his hands in a nervous gesture. I can't tell you, I really can't tell you. After the first visit, she pressed me to come again, spoke of being lonely and unhappy. She made it difficult for me to refuse. She showed so plainly her fondness and affection for me that I was placed in an awkward position. You see, Mr. Mahern, I've got a weak nature. I drift. I'm one of those people who can't say no. And, believe me or not, as you like, after the third or fourth visit I paid her, I found myself getting genuinely fond of the old thing. My mother died when I was young, an aunt brought me up, and she too died before I was fifteen. If I told you that I genuinely enjoyed being mothered and pampered, I dare say you'd only laugh. Mr. Mahon did not laugh. Instead, he took off his pince-nez again and polished them, always a sign with him that he was thinking deeply. I accept your explanation, Mr. Vole, he said at last. I believe it to be psychologically probable. Whether a jury would take that view of it is um, another matter. Please continue your narrative. When was it that Miss French first asked you to look into her business affairs? After my third or fourth visit to her, she understood very little of money matters and was worried about some investments. Mr. Mahern looked up sharply. Be careful, Mr. Vole. The maid, Janet Mackenzie, declares that her mistress was a good woman of business, 
and transacted all her own affairs, and this is borne out by the testimony of her bankers. I can't help that, said Vole earnestly. That's what she said to me. Mr. Mahan looked at him for a moment or two in silence. Though he had no intention of saying so, his belief in Leonard Vole's innocence was at that moment strengthened. He knew something of the mentality of elderly ladies. He saw Miss French, infatuated with the good-looking young man, hunting about for pretexts that should bring him to the house. What more likely than she should plead ignorance of business and beg him to help her with her money affairs? She was enough of a woman of the world to realize that any man is slightly flattered by such an admission of his superiority. Leonard Vole had been flattered. Perhaps, too, she had not been averse to letting this young man know that she was wealthy. Emily French had been a strong-willed old woman, willing to pay her price for what she wanted. All this passed rapidly through Mr. Mahon's mind, but he gave no indication of it, and asked instead a further question. And did you handle her affairs for her at her request? I did. Mr. Vole, said the solicitor, I am going to ask you a very serious question, and one to which it is vital I should have a truthful answer. You were in low water financially. You had the handling of an old lady's affairs, an old lady who, according to her own statement, knew little or nothing of business. Did you, at any time, or in any manner, convert to your own use the securities which you handled? Did you engage in any transaction for your own pecuniary advantage which will not bear the light of day? He quelled the other's response. Wait a minute before you answer. There are two courses open to us. Either we can make a feature of your probity and honesty in conducting her affairs, whilst pointing out how unlikely it is that you would commit murder to obtain money which you might have obtained by such infinitely easier means. If, uh, on the other hand, there is anything in your dealings which the prosecution will get hold of, if, uh, to put it baldly, it can be proved that you swindled the old lady in any way, we must take the line that you had no motive for murder, since she was already a profitable source of income to you. You perceive the distinction. Now, I beg of you, take your time before you reply. But Leonard Vole took no time at all. My dealings with Miss French's affairs are all perfectly fair and above board. I acted for her interest to the very best of my ability, as any one will find who looks into the matter. Thank you, said Mr. Mayhern. You relieve my mind very much. I pay you the compliment of believing that you are far too clever to lie to me over such an important matter. Surely, said Vole eagerly, the, the strongest point in my favour is the lack of motive. Granted that I cultivated the acquaintanceship of a rich old lady in the hopes of getting money out of her, that, I gather, is the substance of what you've been saying, surely her death frustrates all my hopes. The solicitor looked at him steadily. Then, very deliberately, he repeated his unconscious trick with his pince-nez. It was not until they were firmly replaced on his nose that he spoke. Are you not aware, Mr. Vole, that Miss French left a will, under which you are the principal beneficiary? What? The prisoner sprang to his feet, his dismay obvious and unforced. My God! What are you saying? She left her money to me? Mr. Mayher nodded slowly. Vole sank down again, his head in his hands. You pretend to know nothing of this will. Pretend there's no pretense about it. I knew nothing about it. What would you say if I told you that the maid, Janet Mackenzie, swears that you did know, that her mistress told her distinctly that she had consulted you in the matter and told you of her intentions? Say that she's lying. No, I go too fast. Janet is an elderly woman. She was a faithful watchdog to her mistress, and she didn't like me. She was jealous and suspicious. I should say that Miss French confided her intentions to Janet. 
and that Janet either mistook something she said or else was convinced in her own mind that I had persuaded the old lady into doing it. I dare say that she believes herself now that Miss French actually told her so. You don't think she dislikes you enough to lie deliberately about the matter? Leonard Vole looked shocked and startled. No, indeed, why should she? I don't know, said Mr. Mahon thoughtfully. But she's very bitter against you. The wretched young man groaned again. I'm beginning to see, he muttered. It's frightful. I made up to her, that's what they'll say. I got her to make a will leaving her money to me. And then? I go there that night and there's nobody in the house. They find her the next day. Oh, my God, it's awful! You are wrong about there being nobody in the house, said Mr. Mayhern. Janet, as you remember, was to go out for the evening. She went, but about half past nine she returned to fetch the pattern of a blouse sleeve which she had promised to a friend. She let herself in by the back door, went upstairs and fetched it, and went out again. She heard voices in the sitting-room, though she could not distinguish what they said. But she will swear that one of them was Miss French's, and one was a man's. At half past nine, said Leonard Vold, at half past nine, he sprang to his feet. But then I'm saved, saved. Uh, what do you mean, saved? cried Mr. Mahern, astonished. By half past nine, I was at home again. My wife can prove that. I left Miss French about five minutes to nine. I arrived home about twenty past nine. My wife was there waiting for me. Oh, thank God, thank God. God, and bless Janet Mackenzie's sleeve pattern. In his exuberance, he hardly noticed that the grave expression of the solicitor's face had not altered, but the latter's words brought him down to earth with a bump. Who, then, in your opinion, murdered Miss French? Why, a, a burglar, of course, as was thought at first. The window was forced, you remember, as she was killed with a heavy blow from a crowbar, and the crowbar was found lying on the floor beside the body, and several articles were missing. But for Janet's absurd suspicions and dislike of me, the police would never have swerved from the right track. That will hardly do, Mr. Vole, said the solicitor. The things that were missing were mere trifles of no value taken as a blind, and the marks on the window were not at all conclusive. Besides, think for yourself. You say you were no longer in the house by half-past nine. Who then was the man Janet heard talking to Miss French in the sitting-room? She would hardly be having an amicable conversation with a burglar. No, said Vaux, no. He looked puzzled and discouraged. Uh, but anyway, he added with reviving spirit, it lets me out. I've got an alibi. You must see Romaine, my wife, at once. Certainly, acquiesced the lawyer. I should have already seen uh, Mrs. Vole, but for her being absent when you were arrested. I wired to Scotland at once, and I understand that she arrives back tonight. I am going to call upon her immediately I leave here. Vole nodded, a great expression of satisfaction settling down over his face. Yes, Romaine will tell you. My God, it's a lucky chance, that. "'Excuse me, Mr. Vole, but are you very fond of your wife?' "'Of course. And she of you? Romaine is devoted to me. She'd do anything in the world for me.' He spoke enthusiastically, but the solicitor's heart sank a little lower. "'The testimony of a devoted wife, would it gain credence? "'Was there anyone else who saw you return at nine-twenty? A, "'A maid, for instance. We have no maid.' Did you meet anyone in the street on the way back? Nobody I knew. I rode part of the way in a bus. The conductor might remember. Mr. Mahon shook his head doubtfully. Uh, there is no one, then, who can confirm your wife's testimony. No, but it isn't necessary, surely. I dare say not, I dare say not, said Mr. Mahon hastily. Now, um, there's just one thing more. Did Miss French know that you were a married man? Oh, yes. Yet you never took your wife to see her. Why was that? For the first time, Leonard Vole's answer came halting and uncertain. Well, 
I don't know. Are you aware that Janet Mackenzie says her mistress believed you to be single and contemplated uh, marrying you in the future? Vole laughed. Absurd. There was forty years' difference in age between us. It has been done, said the solicitor dryly. The fact remains, your wife never met Miss French. No, again the constraint. You will permit me to say, said the lawyer, that I hardly understand your attitude in the matter. Vole flushed, hesitated, and then spoke. I'll make a clean breast of it. I was hard up, as you know. I hoped that Miss French might lend me some money. She was fond of me, but she wasn't at all interested in the struggles of a young couple. Early on, I found that she'd taken it for granted that my wife and I uh, didn't get on, uh, were living apart. Uh, Mr. Mayhern, I wanted the money. For Romaine's sake. I said nothing and allowed the old lady to think what she chose. She spoke of my being an adopted son to her. There was never any question of marriage. That must be Janet's imagination. And that is all? Yes, that's all. Was there just a shade of hesitation in the words? The lawyer fancied so. He rose and held out his hand. Uh, Goodbye, Mr. Vole. He looked into the haggard young face and spoke with an unusual impulse. I believe in your innocence, in spite of the multitude of facts arrayed against you. I hope to prove it and vindicate you completely. Vole smiled back at him. You'll find the alibi is all right, he said cheerfully. Again, he hardly noticed that the other did not respond. The whole thing hinges a good deal on the testimony of Janet Mackenzie, said Mr. Mayhern. She hates you, that much is clear. She can hardly hate me, protested the young man. The solicitor shook his head as he went out. Now for Mrs. Vole, he said to himself. He was seriously disturbed by the way the thing was shaping. The Voles lived in a small, shabby house near Paddington Green. It was to this house that Mr. Mayhern went. In answer to his ring, a big, slatternly woman, obviously a charwoman, answered the door. Mrs. Vole, has she returned yet? Got back an hour ago, but I don't know if you can see her. If you will take my card to her, said Mr. Mahon quietly, I- I'm quite sure she will do so. The woman looked at him doubtfully, wiped her hand on her apron and took the card. Then she closed the door in his face and left him on the step outside. In a few minutes, however, she returned with a slightly altered manner. Come inside, please. She ushered him into a tiny drawing-room. Mr. Mayhern, examining a drawing on the wall, started up suddenly to face a tall, pale woman who had entered so quietly that he hadn't heard her. "'Mr. Mayhern, you are my husband's solicitor, are you not? You have come from him. Will you please sit down?' Until she spoke, he had not realised that she was not English, Now, observing her more closely, he noticed the high cheekbones, the dense blue-black of the hair, and an occasional very slight movement of the hands that was distinctly foreign. A strange woman, very quiet, so quiet as to make one uneasy. From the very first, Mr. Mahon was conscious that he was up against something that he did not understand. Now, uh, my dear Mrs. Vole, he began, you must not give way. He stopped. It was so very obvious that Romaine Vole had not the slightest intention of giving way. She was perfectly calm and composed. Will you please tell me all about it, she said. I must know everything. Do not think to spare me. I want to know the worst. She hesitated, then repeated in a lower tone with a curious emphasis which the lawyer did not understand. I want to know the worst. Mr. Mahon went over his interview with Leonard Vole. She listened attentively, nodding her head now and then. I see, she said, when he had finished. He wants me to say that he came in at twenty minutes past nine that night. He did come in at that time, said Mr. Mahon sharply. That is not the point, she said coldly. Will my saying so acquit him? Will they believe me? Mr. Mahon was taken aback. 
she had gone so quickly to the core of the matter. That is what I want to know, she said. Will it be enough? Is there anyone else who can support my evidence? There was a suppressed eagerness in her manner that made him vaguely uneasy. Uh, so far there is no one else, he said reluctantly. I see, said Romaine Vol. She sat for a minute or two, perfectly still. A little smile played over her lips. The lawyer's feeling of alarm grew stronger and stronger. Uh, Mrs. Vole, he began, I know what you must feel. Do you? she said. I wonder. In the circumstances. In the circumstances. I intend to play a lone hand. He looked at her in dismay. But, my dear Mrs. Vole, you are overwrought, being so devoted to your husband. I beg your pardon? The sharpness of her voice made him start. He repeated in a hesitating manner, being so devoted to your husband. Romaine Vole nodded slowly, the same strange smile on her lips. Did he tell you that I was devoted to him? she asked softly. Ah, yes, I can see he did. How stupid men are. Stupid, stupid, stupid. She rose suddenly to her feet. All the intense emotion that the lawyer had been conscious of in the atmosphere was now concentrated in her tone. I hate him. I tell you, I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. I would like to see him hanged by the neck till he is dead. The lawyer recoiled before her and the smouldering passion in her eyes. She advanced a step nearer and continued vehemently. Perhaps I shall see it. Supposing I tell you that he did not come in that night at twenty past nine, but at twenty past ten. You say that he tells you he knew nothing about the money coming to him. Supposing I tell you he knew all about it and counted on it and committed murder to get it. Supposing I tell you that he admitted to me that night when he came in what he had done, that there was blood on his coat. What then? Supposing that I stand up in court and say all these things. Her eyes seemed to challenge him. With an effort he concealed his growing dismay and endeavoured to speak in a rational tone. Y you cannot be asked to give evidence against your husband. He is not my husband! The words came out so quickly that he fancied he had misunderstood her. I beg your pardon, I... He is not my husband! The silence was so intense that you could have heard a pin drop. I was an actress in Vienna. My husband is alive but in a madhouse. So we could not marry. I am glad now. She nodded defiantly. I should like you to tell me one thing, said Mr. Mayhern. He contrived to appear as cool and unemotional as ever. Why are you so bitter against Leonard Vole? She shook her head, smiling a little. Yes, he would like to know, but I shall not tell you. I will keep my secret. Mr. Mahon gave his dry little cough and rose. There seems uh, no point in prolonging this interview, he remarked. You will hear from me again after I have communicated with my client. She came closer to him, looking into his eyes with her own wonderful dark ones. Tell me, she said, did you believe honestly that he was innocent when you came here today? I did, said Mr. Mayhern. You poor little man, she laughed. And I believe so still, finished the lawyer. Uh, good evening, madam. He went out of the room, taking with him the memory of her startled face. This is going to be a devil of a business, said Mr. Mayhern to himself as he strode along the street. Extraordinary, the whole thing. An extraordinary woman, a very dangerous woman. Women were the devil when they got their knife into you. What was to be done? That wretched young man hadn't a leg to stand upon. Of course, possibly, he did commit the crime. No, said Mr. Mayhern to himself, no, there's almost too much evidence against him. I don't believe this woman. She was trumping up the whole story, but she'll never bring it to court. He wished he felt more conviction on the point. 
The police court proceedings were brief and dramatic. The principal witnesses for the prosecution were Janet McKenzie, maid to the dead woman, and Romaine Heilger, an Austrian subject, the mistress of the prisoner. Mr. Mayhern sat in court and listened to the damning story that the latter told. It was on the lines she had indicated to him in their interview. The prisoner reserved his defence and was committed for trial. Mr. Mayhern was at his wit's end. The case against Leonard Vole was black beyond words. Even the famous KC who was engaged for the defence held out little hope. If we can't shake the Austrian woman's testimony, we might do something, he said dubiously, but it's a bad business. Mr. Mayhern had concentrated his energies on one single point. Assuming Leonard Vole to be speaking the truth, and to have left the murdered woman's house at nine o'clock, who was the man whom Janet heard talking to Miss French at half-past nine? The only ray of light was in the shape of a scapegrace nephew, who had in bygone days cajoled and threatened his aunt out of various sums of money. Janet Mackenzie, the solicitor learned, had always been attached to this young man, and had never ceased urging his claims upon her mistress. It certainly seemed possible that it was this nephew who had been with Miss French after Leonard Vaux left, especially as he was not to be found in any of his old haunts. In all other directions, the lawyer's researches had been negative in their result. No one had seen Leonard Vole entering his own house or leaving that of Miss French. No one had seen any other man enter or leave the house in Cricklewood. All inquiries drew blank. It was the eve of the trial when Mr. Mayhern received the letter which was to lead his thoughts in an entirely new direction. It came by the six o'clock post, an illiterate scrawl written on common paper and enclosed in a dirty envelope with the stamp stuck on crooked. Mr. Mayhern read it through once or twice before he grasped its meaning. Dear Mr., you're the lawyer, chap, or axe for the young feller. If you want that painted foreign hussy showed up for what she is and a pack of lies, you come to 16 Shaw's Rent Stepney tonight. It'll cost ya 200 quid. Ask for Mrs. Mogson. The solicitor read and reread this strange epistle. It might, of course, be a hoax, but when he thought it over, he became increasingly convinced that it was genuine and also convinced that it was the one hope for the prisoner. The evidence of Romain Heilger damned him completely, and the line the defence meant to pursue, the line that the evidence of a woman who had admittedly lived an immoral life was not to be trusted, was at best a weak one. Mr. Mahern's mind was made up. It was his duty to save his client at all costs. He must go to Shaw's rents. He had some difficulty in finding the place, a ramshackle building in an evil-smelling slum, but at last he did so, and on inquiry for Mrs. Mogson was sent up to a room on the third floor. On this door he knocked, and getting no answer, knocked again. At this second knock he heard a shuffling sound inside, and presently the door was opened, cautiously half an inch, and a bent figure peered out. Suddenly the woman, for it was a woman, gave a chuckle and opened the door wider. So it's you, dearie, she said in a wheezy voice. Nobody with you, is there? Now playing tricks. That's right. You can come in. You can come in. With some reluctance, the lawyer stepped across the threshold into the small, dirty room with its flickering gas jet. There was an untidy, unmade bed in a corner, a plain deal table and two rickety chairs. For the first time, Mr. Mayhern had a full view of the tenant of this unsavoury apartment. She was a woman of middle age, bent in figure, with a mass of untidy grey hair and a scarf wound tightly round her face. She saw him looking at this and laughed again, the same curious, toneless chuckle. Wondering why I eyed my beauty, dear. <laughs> Afraid it may tempt you, eh? 
but you shall see, you shall see. She drew aside the scarf, and the lawyer recoiled involuntarily before the almost formless blur of scarlet. She replaced the scarf again. So you're not wanting to kiss me, dearie? <laughs> I don't wonder. And yet, I was a pretty girl once. Not so long ago as you'd think either. Vitriol, dearie, vitriol, that's what did it. Ah, but I'll be even with them. She burst into a hideous torrent of profanity, which Mr. Mahan tried vainly to quell. She fell silent at last, her hands clenching and unclenching themselves nervously. Enough of that, said the lawyer sternly. I've come here because I have reason to believe that you can give me information which will clear my client, Leonard Vole. Is that the case? Her eyes leered at him cunningly. What about the money, dearie? She wheezed. Two hundred quid, you remember. It's your duty to give evidence, and you can be called upon to do so. That won't do, dearie. I'm an old woman and I know nothing. But you give me two hundred quid, and perhaps I can give you a hint or two, see? What kind of hint? What should you say to a letter? A letter from her? Never mind how I got hold of it. It's my business. It'll do the trick. But I want my two hundred quid. Mr. Mahan looked at her coldly and made up his mind. I'll give you ten pounds, nothing more. And only that if this letter is what you say it is. Ten pan? She screamed and raved at him. Twenty, said Mr. Mahan, and that's my last word. He rose as if to go. Then, watching her closely, he drew out a pocket book and counted out twenty one-pound notes. You see, he said, that's all I have with me. You can take it or leave it. But already he knew that the sight of the money was too much for her. She cursed and raved impotently, but at last she gave in. Going over to the bed, she drew something out from beneath the tattered mattress "'Here you are, damn ya!' she snarled. "'It's the top one you want.' It was a bundle of letters that she threw to him. And Mr. Mahern untied them and scanned them in his usual cool, methodical manner. The woman, watching him eagerly, could gain no clue from his impassive face. He read each letter through, then returned again to the top one and read it a second time. Then he tied the whole bundle up again carefully. They were love letters, written by Romain Heilger, and the man they were written to was not Leonard Vole. The top letter was dated the day of the latter's arrest. I spoke true, dearie, didn't I? whined the woman. It'll do for her, that letter. Mr. Mahan put the letters in his pocket, then he asked the question. How did you get hold of this correspondence? That's telling, she said with a leer. But I know something more. I heard in court what the assie said. Find out where she was at twenty past ten, the time she says she was at home. Ask at the Lion Road Cinema. They remember. A fine upstanding girl like that. Curse her. Who is the man? asked Mr. Mahern. There is only a Christian name here. The other's voice grew thick and hoarse. Her hands clenched and unclenched. Finally, she lifted one to her face. He's a man that did this to me. Many years ago now. She took him away from me. A chit of a girl she was then. And when I went after him, and went for him too, he threw the cursed stuff at me. And she laughed, damn her. I've had it in for her for years. Followed her, I have. Spied upon her. And there, I've got her. She'll suffer for this, won't she, Mr. Lawyer? She'll suffer. She will probably be sentenced to, to a term of imprisonment for perjury, said Mr. Mahern quietly. Shut away, that's what I want. You're going, are ya? Where's my money? Where's that good money? Without a word, Mr. Mahern put down the notes on the table. Then, drawing a deep breath, he turned and left the squalid room. Looking back, he saw the old woman crooning over the money. He wasted no time. He found the cinema in Lion Road easily enough, 
and shown a photograph of Romain Heilger, the commissionaire recognised her at once. She had arrived at the cinema with a man some time after ten o'clock on the evening in question. He had not noticed her escort particularly, but he remembered the lady who had spoken to him about the picture that was showing. They stayed until the end, about an hour later. Mr. Mahern was satisfied. Romain Heilger's evidence was a tissue of lies from beginning to end. She had evolved it out of her passionate hatred. The lawyer wondered whether he would ever know what lay behind that hatred. What had Leonard Vole done to her? He had seen dumbfounded when the solicitor had reported her attitude to him. He had declared earnestly that such a thing was incredible. Yet it had seemed to Mr. Mayhern that after the first astonishment his protests had lacked sincerity. He did know. Mr. Mayhern was convinced of it. He knew, but he had no intention of revealing the fact. The secret between those two remained a secret. Mr. Mahon wondered if some day he should come to learn what it was. The solicitor glanced at his watch. It was late, but time was everything. He hailed a taxi and gave an address. Sir Charles must know of this at once, he murmured to himself as he got in. The trial of Leonard Vole for the murder of Emily French aroused widespread interest. In the first place, the prisoner was young and good-looking. Then he was accused of a particularly dastardly crime. And there was the further interest of Romain Heilger, the principal witness for the prosecution. There had been pictures of her in many papers, and several fictitious stories as to her origin and history. The proceedings opened quietly enough. Various technical evidence came first. Then Janet Mackenzie was called. She told substantially the same story as before. In cross-examination, counsel for the defence succeeded in getting her to contradict herself once or twice over her account of Vole's association with Miss French. He emphasised the fact that though she had heard a man's voice in the sitting-room that night, there was nothing to show that it was Vole who was there, and he managed to drive home a feeling that jealousy and dislike of the prisoner were at the bottom of a good deal of her evidence. Then the next witness was called. Your name is Romain Heilger. Yes. You are an Austrian subject. Yes. For the last three years you have lived with the prisoner and passed yourself off as his wife. Just for a moment Romain Heilger's eyes met those of the man in the dock. Her expression held something curious and unfathomable. Yes, the questions went on. Word by word the damning facts came out. On the night in question the prisoner had taken out a crowbar with him. He had returned at twenty minutes past ten and had confessed to having killed the old lady. His cuffs had been stained with blood and he had burned them in the kitchen stove. He had terrorised her into silence by means of threats. As the story proceeded, the feeling of the court, which had to begin with been slightly favourable to the prisoner, now sat dead against him. He himself sat with downcast head and moody air, as though he knew he were doomed. Yet it might have been noted that her own counsel sought to restrain Romaine's animosity. He would have preferred her to be a more unbiased witness. Formidable and ponderous counsel for the defence arose. He put it to her that her story was a malicious fabrication from start to finish, that she had not even been in her own house at the time in question, that she was in love with another man and was deliberately seeking to send Vole to his death for a crime he did not commit. Romain denied these allegations with superb insolence. Then came the surprising denouement, the production of the letter. It was read aloud in court in the midst of a breathless stillness. Max, beloved, the fates have delivered him into our hands. He has been arrested for murder, but yes, the murder of an old lady. Leonard, who would not hurt a fly. At last, I shall have my revenge, the poor chicken. 
I shall say that he came in that night with blood upon him, that he confessed to me. I shall hang him, Max, and when he hangs he will know and realize that it was Romaine who sent him to his death. And then happiness, beloved, happiness at last. There were experts present ready to swear that the handwriting was that of Romain Heilger, but they were not needed. Confronted with the letter, Romain broke down utterly and confessed everything. Leonard Vohl had returned to the house at the time he said, twenty past nine. She had invented the whole story to ruin him. With the collapse of Romain Heilger, the case for the Crown collapsed also. Sir Charles called his few witnesses, the prisoner himself went into the box and told his story in a manly, straightforward manner, unshaken by cross-examination. The prosecution endeavoured to rally, but without great success. The judge's summing up was not wholly favourable to the prisoner, but a reaction had set in, and the jury needed little time to consider their verdict. We find the prisoner not guilty. Leonard Vole was free. Little Mr. Mayhern hurried from his seat. He must congratulate his client. He found himself polishing his pince-nez vigorously and checked himself. His wife had told him only the night before that he was getting a habit of it. Curious things, habits. People themselves never knew they had them. An interesting case, a very interesting case. That woman now, Romaine Heilger. The case was dominated for him still by the exotic figure of Romaine Heilger. She had seemed a pale, quiet woman in the house at Paddington. But in court she had flamed out against the sober background. She had flaunted herself like a tropical flower. If he closed his eyes, he could see her now, tall and vehement, her exquisite body bent forward a little, her right hand clenching and unclenching itself unconsciously all the time. Curious things, habits. That gesture of hers with the hand was her habit, he supposed. Yet he had seen someone else do it quite lately. Who was it now? Quite lately. He drew in his breath with a gasp as it came back to him. The woman in Shaw's rents. He stood still, his head whirling. It was impossible, impossible. Yet, Romaine Heilger was an actress. The KC came up behind him and clapped him on the shoulder. Congratulated our man yet? He's had a narrow shave, you know. Come along and see him. But the little lawyer shook off the other's hand. He wanted one thing only, to see Romaine Heilger face to face. He didn't see her until some time later, and the place of their meeting is not relevant. So you guessed, she said, when he had told her all that was in his mind. The face, ach, that was easy enough, and the light of that gas jet was too bad for you to see the make-up. But, but why? Why? Why did I play a lone hand? She smiled a little, remembering the last time she had used the words. Such an elaborate comedy. My friend, I had to save him. The evidence of a woman devoted to him would not have been enough. You hinted as much yourself. But I know something of the psychology of crowds. Let my evidence be wrung from me as an admission, damning me in the eyes of the law and a reaction in favour of the prisoner would immediately set in. And the bundle of letters? One alone, the vital one, might have seemed like, uh, what do you call it, a put-up job. Then the man called Max? Never existed, my friend. I still think, said little Mr. Mayhern, in an aggrieved manner, that we could have got him off by the, by the normal procedure. I dared not risk it, you see. You thought he was innocent, and you knew it, I see, said little Mr. Mayhern. My dear Mr. Mayhern, said Romaine, you do not see at all. I knew he was guilty.
Well, there we are. I just you, normally at this point I say something about the story and the author, but I just want to applaud um, Dame Agatha Christie's expertise. That was a fantastically constructed story. I recently saw a dramatization of it uh, by, with Toby Jones in it, and they they did it justice. It was very good, but I think the story is better than the. I thought the dramatization was really really good, but I think the story is better now. Let us say something about um, my German accent, or Austrian accent. I only have one version of that, like I only have one Irish accent, one Scottish accent, one American accent, and I bring them out. I keep them in a drawer, and I bring them out to the chagrin and disgust of many listeners. But I can't help myself, so I've got to do it. I mean, I had to do it. I had to do it. Come on. I enjoyed doing it as well. Um, she talks a bit, who, there's one, one, one of the characters in my Dracula talks a bit like that as well. Anyway, so let's say something about Agatha. You know it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's not just cut and pasted from Wiki, by the way. And if you don't want to hear any of this, just really stop. Don't, don't enrage yourself. Life is too short. If you're really upset by listening to me talk about these things, do yourself a favour, and me actually, and stop. All right, just stop listening. Right, but for those of you my friends, as I like to call you, who are on board with this. Because I don't do it for those other people who have now stopped listening. They've stopped so I can say that about them now. Uh, I, don't, I don't do this work for them. Um, I do it for you. Anyway, uh, Agatha Christie, born 1890, died 1976, was an English crime novelist, in case you didn't know, short story writer and playwright, best known for her 66 Count Them detective novels and 14 short story collections featuring iconic characters like Hercule Poirot, you can only be grateful he didn't appear, that I didn't have to do my Belgian accent, and Miss Marple, that I didn't have to do my posh old lady accent. Hello, dear. Um, born into a wealthy upper middle class family in Torquay, Devon, Christie began writing in the wake of World War I and achieved widespread success with her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, 1920. She went on to become one of the most prolific, as we've seen, and influential authors of the golden age of detective fiction, penning classic works such as The Murder on the Orient Express, Death on the Nile, and the world's longest-running play, The Mousetrap. I remember going to see that in about 1980, and it was very, very uncomfortable, though it was very hot. In the theatre, it was in it was these raked seating. There's no room for your knees. It was excruciatingly uncomfortable. Uh, which, but the play itself was pretty good. Um, you know, Death on the Nile, The Mouse Trap. Her personal life was marked by a mysterious 11-day disappearance in 1926 and two marriages, including a long and happy union with the archaeologist Max Malowan, if that's how you say his name, appointed Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1971. She is the best-selling fiction writer of all time, and you can see it. I've read Christie stories where I've thought, yeah, but uh, this was great, um, I thought. Just for the record, at the moment, I'm doing, um, talking about accents, I'm doing The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. I'm about just over halfway through it, and hopefully I'll finish it and post it, probably on the Classic Ghost Stories podcast, although you could argue there's a crime in it. Uh, well, I think there is. But um, I, I bring my French accent out in that, not too much, and also my singing voice. What was the point of me saying that? Ah, yeah, the point is, after I finish that, I'm either going to do uh, We Have Always Lived at the Castle by Shirley Jackson or The Murder of um, Roger Ackroyd by Dame Agatha. I may go for that one, you know. I may go for that one. Okay. Going back to Agatha, as I call her, Aggie, uh, she was a pioneering and an innovative writer who revolutionised crime fiction. She did with her clever plots, plots, intricate mysteries and surprising twists. So. The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, 1926, no spoilers, no spoilers, um, contains the first unreliable narrator. So you can't trust the narrator. And the convention was, of course, you trusted the narrator in general terms. I think Tristram Shandy, probably one of the first novels, you're not certain if you can trust him but um, and what he tells you because he's a liar. But um, but in general terms, we the convention was... The narrator was a, a voice of authority and to be trusted, and, and uh, Christie subverted that. This twist at the end here, I thought was marvellously done. And um, 
again, it's not a spoiler because you've just listened to the flipping story. I imagine there's no none of you who have actually skipped the story. There may be. That would be weird if there was. You've skipped the story and come to my commentary. Um, but um, that twist, I knew it because I'd come across the story before. But uh, even so, it's so brilliantly done. So brilliantly done. And what is really interesting is the genre switch, if you like. I'm just reading a book by a guy called John Truby called The Anatomy of Genres. And he he talks about the, the cluster of crime genres. First of all, there is crime, where you have generally a, a lawman, usually a lawman, can be a lawwoman, and they, they know pretty much who the criminal is. There's no mystery to it in most cases. And they are there, and it's, it's a kind of um, a good versus bad battle whereby the power of law, the power of society, the power of right, the ordered balance of society where people are rewarded for doing good things and punished for doing bad things, that's what it's all about, and they're going to punish it. There's no mystery about it. That's the crime novel, John Truby says, a crime story. Then we have um, variants of that. We have the detective. In that... Um, the crime is done, it's not so much about, it is a little bit about righting wrongs, but the focus of the story is the detection, is the investigation, and it's about um, finding out how, who, and why uh, the crime was done. And that is the, the, the crux of the story, and that's what she plays with. She's subverting us, she's, she's foreshadowing, she's putting red herrings in, you know, um, and the good the good detective novel does that. He also talks about um, the. Uh, I'm going to mention the the thriller. The thriller, he says, is very often. Um, she says, no, John Truby says. I'm mixing Agatha Christie and John Truby up here. Um, Truby says the thriller is also very often a um, a detection story. It can be about them uncovering who. The, and it often is about uncovering who the criminal is. It can also be that you know who the criminal is, but the thriller, the key thing is that um, the, the, the narrator, the protagonist themselves is in deadly danger. And that isn't usually the case in detective fiction. In, as in this story and in most detective fiction, Sherlock Holmes is, is rarely in any serious danger himself. Um, Poirot is rarely any serious danger in most of the detective stories, whereas the thriller, and when we get into hard boiled, are both slightly different because in many cases, in some of the great cases like Roman Chandler and stuff like that, we it is a detective story. We are finding out who the criminal is, but in some cases we know in the hard boiled who the bad guys are, and it's more like a crime story. Um, uh, but it can be a thriller as well. Do you see? You see the. I see the distinction he makes. The final of the quartet of crime genres he talks about is the gangster story, and we see this sort of in um, some like Ocean's Eleven, but also um, I don't know if this is completely true. But the gangster movies like Long Good Friday, and whereas the gangster, we end up rooting for the gangster a bit. The gangster is the hero, so the criminal is the hero, and I'm only mentioning these. Well, I'm, I'm not only mentioning, I think it's a really interesting categorization of the, the groups of crime stories that we come across, but, um, but also uh, because this, it, who is the hero in this? It isn't Mayhew, who we may feel sympathetic towards. He's been duped, he's, he's been very foolish, and why? I suppose he begins by not believing the young man, but there's something... And I'm not sure this was bottomed out. I think if she'd kind of thrown... And here's me telling Agatha Christie how to write, but I'm, I'm, forgive me, Agatha. Um, but um, if she'd thrown a little bit more light onto his motivation, said he was a, 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 a Christian man or a very devout man or believed, you know, he'd spent his career um, as a human rights lawyer or something. I mean, they didn't have those in the 1920s. But, um, you know, that he was motivated by, I think, uh, to do good. To, to, you know, if he had a real personal, that would have been kind of more convincing. But in this case, he just, it's not really clear why we told he doesn't believe him and then he does believe him. Why would you believe him? I think she could have given him a May, Mayhew, a bit of a stronger uh, motivation for wanting this, this young man to be innocent. But in the end, he's a fool. He's a, he's a dupe. He's a fool. 
He's an easy mark. Well, he isn't necessarily an easy mark, but he's completely outwitted by the criminals. And so that's why I say that it perhaps falls into the gangster genre, because the criminals, in fact, uh, because I, I would say to you, the real hero of this story is Romain Heilger, who is um, resourceful, intelligent, a talented actress. And in the uh, dramatizations, she's very beautiful as well. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, I think that it is her, it is she. And so uh, the other aspects of the story, probably just to mention, are the, the moral ambiguities of the, the lawyer in this case. I've got a friend who's a criminal lawyer, and the stories he tells you make your hair stand on end, but uh, over a drink, you know. Um, and, yeah, so in many cases, they, they may know or suspect that their client is guilty, and perhaps the other way around, that if they're for the prosecution, they may know or suspect that their client is innocent, but their, their, their job is to, is to put them away, prosecute them, you know, um, because of the adversarial, because I suppose in the, in the uh, English common law tradition, which includes the just, justice systems of, I hate to say it, but the ex-colonies, I know you don't like us saying that, but, um, but um, you know, that have inherited English common law, such as Canada, Australia, uh, the US, um, New Zealand, you know, we could go on. That, that it is adversarial, wherein in some, some countries it is uh, inquisitorial, so they're trying to find out the truth, whereas our systems are about one side trying to beat the other side almost in, in a gamified way. So the moral ambiguity of what do you do, it's a really interesting question. You may suspect your client is either innocent or guilty, but your role may be uh, not interested in the truth, but interested in a particular result. Uh, and then, of course, the final thing to say, and remember, Christie's a woman, and she was a very successful woman novelist. She wasn't the first because we have uh, Mrs. Gaskell. We have a lot of uh, successful female Victorian novelists before her time, and Radcliffe, yeah, We're going right back to Gothic times. But um, the, I think she uses it... And, I just I'm in so much admiration of Agatha Christie for this story. She uses the idea, you remember that in the 1920s, the, the pub reading public would have pre, as we do in our own way, um, prejudices. And so they would expect a woman, a wife, to play a, perhaps a subservient role in a story anyway, if not in real life. And... Um, she doesn't. She is the, the, the genius behind it, really. He, he just comes over as the, the hitman, and she is the brains, if you like, uh, and the talent, uh, Romain Helga, Helga, I mean. Um, and so she, that was a, must have been a great twist that this woman, who would, they would have expected to be in a secondary role, turns out to be the master genius behind it all. And also... Very interestingly, she's an actress. She is a bigamist. She's not a bigamist, but she's living in sin because she couldn't... Her, her first husband's in a madhouse. So I suppose that lets her off the hook a bit. It would have been actually made her even more morally ambiguous if uh, he'd been... She just abandoned him. But, you know, she has the kind of the fig leaf that the poor man's ill, so therefore... And she can't be expected to be faithful to him, etc., etc., in a far country. And be besides... He's dead, he's not. But, you know, um, but she's a morally ambiguous woman who uh, doesn't behave as a trad wife. So, uh, great story. And I think the power of that is she just deploys that. And that's going to be, whoa, it's kind of surprising to us. But to them, it would be like, whoa. Not that I don't think, actually, that people have changed that much. And although society might have expected uh, the wife to be like that, I think about the women of my family, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. Who live? Who were? You know, my great grandmother was born in the uh, in Victorian times, uh, my grandmother in Edwardian times, and uh, they were tough women who ruled the men of the house. You know, so uh, people haven't changed very much, but society's expectations change. You know, that's just the way it is. Anyway, great story. I thought 
look out for Roger Ackroyd. Okay, final final point. Why am I doing these Christie's and Sherlock Holmes? I'm going to be really honest with you. When I look at my stats for the episodes that get the most downloads, and therefore we would use it as a proxy to say that people are most interested and most enjoy them, Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie. Yeah, so Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, and any Agatha Christie seem to hit the mark. So I'm just going to keep serving those up until I'm bored of them. Uh, the Americans is different. I will keep getting Americans to do the Americans, the, the hard-boiled, which is the other great love of mine. And um, we'll see how we get on. Okay. Hope you're enjoying the, the, the Classic Detective Stories podcast. Please spread the word. Tell your friends. That's the only way we will, we will uh, what's the word? flourish. That's it. Anyway, hope you're all well. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed my chat. And hope if you didn't enjoy my chat, you switched off long ago and are now asleep or watching, listening to the old gods of Appalachia or, or some other worthy podcast.